To begin the tensile metals experiment, we're going to have to take a few measurements and do a calculation on a few of our samples or specimens. We have 1018 steel, 4140, brass, and aluminum. And the first two measurements that you're going to have to obtain are going to be with the calipers. Uh, before I show you an example of that, I'm just going to refer to this diagram showing what two measurements you're going to need. You're going to need the gauge length of the specimen and that is from the two linear or parallel lengths not including the radius portion of where it transitions from the thinner portion of the material to the raw portion. So we want the gauge length from the start before the radius to the opposite end before the radius. That entire gauge length will be necessary and, and needed for your calculations. Second measurement will be your diameter. Diameter will be of the thinner portion where the material was removed. And well, this is not a measurement, but a calculation that you need to do based off your diameter is figure out the cross-sectional area of the sample or the sample size of where we're gonna be looking or where the material will be failing. That cross-sectional area will be of a circle uh, within the thinner portion where the material was removed. Just use the equation pi r squared. You know the diameter divided by two. You should be able to calculate the value. And when it, it's a little bit harder to see, that's why I drew the diagram. But when you're using your calipers, you want to obtain the flattest portions of the, where the material was removed, not including the radius. So you want to try to, at best, it's a little hard, you might have to eyeball where that location is. And what I usually tell students sometimes, let me grab a marker here really quickly, or a pen. pen as I tell students to gauge an area or location and be consistent with it when they run their measurements so I'm going to make an initial marking this is better with a, a marker obviously but I'm going to make two marks where I can see Uh, let me bring this one over just a little bit more. I'm going to make two marks on the sample so I can be consistent every time on where I can obtain those values. So I'm going to place my calipers at those two markings, take their reading. Once we perform the test, we're going to have to obtain that gauge length again. So. The markings are going to come helpful later on as well to make to be consistent on that portion. So we have our gauge length and we can use our calipers to calculate our diameter. Our diameter we want to be sure to obtain them using the tips of the prongs and not the back portion where there's a gap. So those two measurements, once you have those we can begin the experiment or test. Right, before we begin testing, there's, we're going to cover the stress strain curve or diagram so you know what to be looking out for as key points on values that you need to obtain and write in your tables. And looking at the stress strain curve as a general format, a general sense, this is not to scale or drawn perfectly, but there's a few things we do need to consider before grabbing some of these values so you can obtain an understanding. We have a sample that's going to be, or tensile samples or bars are going to be placed in the MTS tester and they'll be put under an axial tensile load, so being pulled on both ends. And as they're being pulled, we have a stress over strain. Our stress is going to be on the Y axis, our strain is going to be on the X axis. Stress is going to be in PSI, pounds per square inch, and our strain is going to be inch over inch. As we're applying that load on the tensile bar, I'm going to use this as an example. We're having an axial load under tension. We're pulling both ends, one being vertical or upward, the other being pulling downward. As we're pulling, we have a linear trend that's going to happen. And this linear trend is going to be an elastic region of where 
if we were to relieve that load on the sample or on the test specimen, if we were to relieve it anywhere along this linear trend, the sample would re return back to its original state of dimension. Nothing will change. Once we pass that form, that linear trend, we're going to start seeing some curvature. That curvature transitions the material into a plastic region. That plastic region permanently deforms the dimension of the original material that you began with. We have our plastic region and we, until failure. So we have a, an elastic, a linear region. A little bit beyond the transition of that linear region, we have our offset yield strength or yield stress, which will be our SY. That value will be obtained by our stress in PSI. We break that curve, that trend from the elastic to plastic. We maximize the total amount of strength that the specimen is able to withhold by the ultimate tensile strength, the UTS. That will be the maximum value that is obtained on this curve. So our UTS, our ultimate tensile strength, will be the maximum stress value or the strength the material is able to withstand before it begins its uh, downward trend to failure. Once we break our ultimate tensile strength value, the strength starts diminishing. We've exceeded the capacity of the material itself. As we exceed the capacity, the material is physically going to deform that we can visually see. And that representation is going to happen as a necking somewhere along the area that we're going to be testing where we have removed the material. And an example of that necking this is uh, not a very great example or demonstration of this, but let me redraw this really quickly here. Our sample originally began to look like this. And what's going to happen is somewhere along this area, what's going to happen is we're going to have another shrinking where the material is going to expand and it's going to lose some of its area at that location due to the expansion of the material. So as that material expands, we have, it creates a void of spacing called the necking region. That necking region is a visual representation that we can see and notifies us we have surpassed our ultimate tensile strength. We continue further to our strain at failure. Our strain at failure is the end point that We've exceeded every capacity of the sample itself, and we have our fracture happen or failure. Our fractures, we're going to essentially go from one single piece to two pieces with a failure point somewhere between the material that was removed. So our failure point will determine or tell us what type of fracture that we do have and some of the characteristics that we can use for the remainder of the test. A few of the key terms that we do have to look at, and one I forgot to mention was the Young's modulus. So Young's modulus can be calculated anywhere along this linear trend. Young's modulus, as long as you have two points along the linear trend, you can use the rise over run equation calculate your Young's modulus by hand. I believe the software will give you Young's modulus, but we also have it here, stress over strain, or the change in stress over the change in strain, given two points along that linear line. Our SY, which I had explained, was our offset yield stress, or yield strength that can be attained on the Y value, or Y axis. Our ultimate tensile strength, the maximum peak that we can obtain, or the maximum strength that we obtain overall, on each of our materials. Uh, we have our final or failure uh, strain, so our total strain at failure on our x-axis, the point at which our single piece becomes two after fracture. This is our plastic strain at failure, an offset to our strain at failure. We can obtain it by our x-axis and our 
uh, fracture work energy equation. We have our offset yield strength or stress plus our ultimate tensile strength divided by two times our total strain at failure will we should be able to attain our fracture energy work at fracture so this is work 